when I read Michael, I kind of think, thank God, thank God for Michael. Um, he, <laughs> he, he, he writes fiction in a way that suggests that English is his first language, <laughs> um, by which I mean he has a fluency that uh, is, I'm sure, very hard worked, but it comes off as so effortless that, um, and, and surprisingly, unusually, uh, comes off for the reader that uh, you are encountering a writer who is perfectly at home and in his element as a writer of the novel. Secondly, when you strip away everything else about uh, when you're talking about the best writers, it's really a balance you're seeking as a reader between uh, books that give you the absolute enjoyment, uh, page-turning momentum, immersion of an entertainment, yet stretch your brain and stretch your emotions and stretch your soul in their way that gives you complete satisfaction on both counts. And, and when I think of Michael, I think of somebody who always strikes that balance perfectly. So, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the future of the novel and the future of the book. I, I, I always feel when I read Michael that, uh, that it's in very safe hands. So would you like to please, first of all, welcome Michael Cunningham. Oh. Now, I don't know who was watching TV last night. Uh, uh, Michael appeared on, on Q&A uh, on the ABC. I kind of felt, Michael, looking at your face, that you felt you were on a program Q&Q. &Q. Uh, <laughs> lots, of, lots of questions occurring to you, but uh, not many answers. So is there anything else you would like to say about porn, uh, gay porn, um, nasty porn, the Israel question, uh, yeah, thank President you. Obama? I'm so happy to have this opportunity because my only regret was, was my, my failure to say during the early portion when Gail was talking about pornography, actually the anus does not fall out as a result <laughs> of anal intercourse. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for letting me say that. It does, it, that actually doesn't happen, <laughs> ever. That, that, that's your formal right of reply, <laughs> and it will be a podcast on the Q&A website uh, that Gail Dines can add to uh, her oft-quoted research. Um, now, the traditional Australian greeting is, um, uh, as you get off the plane, we grab you and say, what do you think of Australia? Are you, in, are you enjoying it here? But you've been here before. before. Yes. Um, what, uh, what, what uh, uh, aside from the invitation, what, uh, what brings you back here? What, uh, what do you like about it here? Oh, I, I love Australia. What do I like about it? about it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, um, I, 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 no, I, I'm struggling to find something original that isn't probably said by, by every visitor who likes Australia. The question has been asked since about 1956. <laughs> <laughs> what about Australia could, could I possibly add? By the way, Malcolm and I are having cocktails, and a waitress will be coming around in a while. <laughs> um, um, you know, it is, I feel, this is not, I'm sure this has been said, but, but, but certainly in my experience in Australia, moving among the sort of literary circles that I've been moving among these, both these visits, is, is that there's a kind of balance here of, of gravitas and a good joke that's hard to find in a lot of places. You know, Berlin is too serious, and, 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 Bar and Madrid isn't serious enough. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 I do think, at least my Australia, which, which is a very particular section of it, but um, I think, I think there's, there's, a, there's a kind of rare balance of that which is serious and that which is like, oh, <laughs> Come on now. Yes. Uh, so I did get we did get chastised by Gail on Q&A for, <laughs> it's not funny. That is my least favorite phrase in the English language, by the way. It's not funny. Well, Americans often say in response to a joke, that's funny. 
Without you laughing, without laughing, laughing. Yeah, I never, commentary. I never yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I should explain. Michael came to Sydney, uh, arrived from home in Sydney last week, and has just come down to Melbourne. I assume you mean the gravitas belongs to Sydney, and the big joke uh, belongs to Melbourne. No. <laughs> you know, I've only just gotten to Melbourne, and I actually could not, in good conscience, say anything about Melbourne, except except the uh, um, Ter- Terence the concierge at the Sofitel is 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 fabulous and uh, incredibly informative. And Terence is the uh, Australian ambassador. Uh, you, you know, he really. should be. Could be. <laughs> um, Speaking about cities and place, um, I've heard it said that, you know, really all uh, great American writing is regional writing. Mm. And, um, you know, reading you by this stage of your career, certainly uh, by nightfall and and looking at your your overall body of work, um, I I wonder if we can call you a New York uh, writer Mm, now. mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, in that that I tend to write about New York, because I, you know, I, I live in New York. If I, if I, if I lived in Sydney, I would, I would write about Sydney. Um, you know, I think that one of the sort of less discussed purposes of the novelist is to act as a witness to his or her times. We are, among our other ambitions, trying to set something down about what it was like to be alive in a place at a time. If, if you wanted to know about 19th century Russia, you would do well, of course, to read various histories and biographies, but you would also want to read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Chekhov because we're the guys and gals who, who are concerned with, with the per- not only the particulars of day-to-day life, but the kind of, you know, the the smell of the air, you know, the buzz of London in 1920, that, that would get lost without, uh, without novelists. And, I, and I, I do think it's very important to be quite specific about your, your place and, and time so that somebody will know about it. Going in the by your protagonist in By Nightfall, Peter Harris, um, that would suggest that th- this is a, t- a time of questioning and a time of, of insecurity for New Yorkers. Oh, it's a time of enormous questioning and insecurity for New Yorkers, as I think it is a time of enormous questioning and insecurity for Americans, because it seems at least medium likely that America is going down. (laughs) <laughs> that, that it's actually going into a decline from which it will not soon recover, as, you know, as did Rome, as did Turkey, as did England. You don't, you don't get to run it, the world that is, forever. And, and I, it's confusing and upsetting to us. <laughs> Well, you've been used to running the world for so long, haven't you? Uh, um, and, yeah, as an individual, I wonder, I wonder how that affects you and, and, and when you're thinking of, of characters that you're writing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, clearly, clearly, it's not an emperor who, whose power is slipping uh, from his grasp. Um, what, what does it mean at the individual level to be, to be going down? Well, frankly, I find it a bit of a relief. <laughs> For, for, for one thing, I don't, I don't think America has done an especially exemplary job of being the world-dominating power for as long as it's been. But, you know, was China, if it's China, will they do better? I don't know. But, um, you know, I actually, as a guy who lives in New York in the U.S. of A., um, feel that it's probably time. That, of course, is easy for a novelist to say, because part of what a novelist is saying when he says this is, hey, big daddies, welcome to my world. Yeah, yeah. 
What about um, your New York is uh, not only a, a place in itself, but um, it, it's a place characters come to from elsewhere. There's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's always that sense of journey between, uh, you know, say the Midwest and New York. Absolutely. Uh, for, Absolutely. for different reasons, characters yeah. end yeah. up in New York. Yeah. Um, does that idea of the, the you know, the, the Emerald City uh, that they come to as a place to find freedom or fulfill fantasy, is that? in challenge mm, uh, no, you, that will, I think I think New York will will sort of hang on to that aspect for at least a while longer and that may increase as, as, as it becomes impossible to find a job in Milwaukee because yeah as, as you say New York is a place to which people go to make it in some way there it's an entire city it's 10 million alpha personalities <laughs> Every single person there is trying to do something, achieve something, get something. You know, I'm, I grew up in Los Angeles where we are a little uh, you know, more relaxed. And um, on one hand, I kind of like that, that, that thing, that charge in the air of New York. But there are times there's a particular New York habit, uh, a pedestrian's habit of... Uh, you get you, you you get you get to a crossroad. It's it's it, it's it's a red it's a red light, and there are cars coming. But you stride halfway into the street because you have places to go and things to do, and it's all I can do not to grab some of these people by by the collars of their of their shirts and say, actually. The future is going to have to get along without you for the next 10 seconds. Stand on the goddamn curb. <laughs> it, it seems a place where you can um, arrive at a meeting and uh, apologize for being late because you were held up in traffic when you weren't actually driving. You were, you were walking and, <laughs> and, and you, couldn't, you couldn't make it across the oncoming traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the cell phone has been a disaster for the pedestrians of New York because it now introduces a huge population of people who are, who are <clears throat> are talking on their cell phones and 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 moving at a pace that it would actually, actually hard to detect as movement at all. Mm. Like stop motion photography would reveal that they were they, they were moving, but in fact they seem to be standing still and sort of weaving back and forth. So you have to get around them, and we do have places to go and things to do. Um, your, your <laughs> and it just I, move along, move along, move along. Keep walking. <laughs> see, I see it's got me. I'm like I'm just like every other monster from New York, aren't I? Not, not that there's ever been a lack of people uh, talking to themselves uh, walking down the streets of New York. It's probably a, a less of an adjustment. Uh, oh, I know that's kind of baffling. Are, are you are you are you crazy to just have a little, one of those little things in your ear? Yes, yes. Well, you'd be used to it um, uh, because people have always uh, talked to themselves as they walked. Uh, oh, I know. You know that, that's actually one of the things I not I love about New York. Not 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 people. Not blazing psychotics who are are you know trying to live on the streets. But but the fact that New York is you know it is like the the bar in Star Wars. It is so incredibly diverse that you cannot walk down a street in New York for five minutes and imagine that you are in any way a typical specimen of life on Earth. <laughs> That's good to be reminded of that. Um, how long have you been there? When you, you, you were born in Ohio? That's right. Oh, yeah, we left for like, in, like, yeah, in 45 minutes. I have no right. You grew up in, was it in Pasadena? I grew up in, in Los Angeles, yes. In yes. Los in, Angeles? In a, in, a sort of, in a sort of lovely, embalmed suburb of Los Angeles, yeah. I'm imagining Mad Men. Uh, your father was a, a, an yeah. advertising man and yeah, yeah, your yeah. mother was a no, homemaker. It, it was very Mad Men. So were you one of the children who, when your parents were having a fight, they'd say, go and watch television? Pretty much. Right. Pretty much. And I, you know, I, I was happy to do it. I love television. I sort of preferred it to my family. <laughs> <laughs> there was more going on, and there were happier endings. You, 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 you had uh, siblings? Uh, I have one younger sister, yeah. Right. Um, but uh, again, you, you've talked about your childhood as, as pretty uh, eventless, um, which, which, can, which can be a kind of a, a big lie, can't it? Uh, nobody, nobody's childhood is that uninteresting. Yeah, yeah. When I when when I say eventless, I mean, of course, unextraordinary to everybody but me. It was quite extraordinary to me, um, and that was that was, I think, one of the reasons that I was such a sucker for 
the modernists, for people like Wolf and, and Joyce when I, I finally read them, because lo and behold, here for the first time in my then young life were books being written by people who insisted on the epic qualities of outwardly ordinary lives. Not only did they insist on writing about people like Clarissa Dalloway and Leopold Bloom, who were just regular sort of people, well, rich in Clarissa's case, but otherwise quite regular. It's just a Tuesday. It's not, it's, it's not a birthday. It's not a funeral. There's just, there's just nothing really going on on the surface and everything going on below the surface. And as a boy who grew up in a quiet little suburb, I was just, that made me delirious, the idea that you could bore in like that, that you could actually look at the world on a sort of a human life in the world, on a sort of subatomic level. Mm. And that was at what age you were, you were getting that kind of enlightenment? I was like 15, I think, when I started reading like, like, like big boy books. <laughs> and, and was that when you, you, you started to want to leave? You started to want to live somewhere I think else? I started, started to want to leave when I was about three, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I always felt like I, I can't speak for every suburb in the world, but certainly the kind of all white, mostly right wing suburb in which I grew up was deeply devoted to the banishment of death, sex, and surprises, which were my three favorite things. So I felt a little like an exchange student who had gone, had been sent to the wrong country. <laughs> Very often for Americans, uh, you know, of, of your nature, um, California and Los Angeles is, is the place they escape mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, was your, did you have a sense uh, at all or an ambition of wanting to escape from Pasadena, Pasadena to Hollywood, or was Hollywood never um, a place you aspired to go? You know, I never really wanted to go to Hollywood. I, when I, grad, I went to college in California, and when I graduated, uh, you know, it, it, as as only an overly romantic, uh, slightly addle headed 22-year-old can thought, I am going out into Kerouac's mad American night. I'm going, to, I'm going to see the American continent firsthand, and I'm going to have affairs and dance on bars, and I'm just going to try to <sighs> see what's out there beyond, beyond the castle wall. Mm. And you, so you went to, Calif you went to San Francisco? To yeah, I started in San Francisco. Well, I, I, I went to school. I went to Stanford, which is kind of outside of San Francisco. Yeah, and, and did that, did that uh, scratch that itch for you? Well, it started to. You know, I, I, I moved to San Francisco with um, my two closest friends from, from college. One of them, still one of my best friends, a woman named Donna Lee, um, who went to Stanford during the weeks, and then on the weekends would go up to San Francisco, where she was the sort of, she was sort of an honorary member of this drag troupe called the Cockettes. <laughs> and they were great. They were, they were, they wore, they had like, like you know, big, they were, wore dresses and hiking boots and big beards, and they were just, they were kind of impossible to classify as any known gender. And you were, you were one of their groupies? Well, no, not exactly. But we moved out. We, I moved to San Francisco with, with Donna Lee, and, and I sort of got, got a job. Because, you know, I, I don't look good in a dress. I'm not, uh, it's not my, my, it doesn't suit me. Um, but, you know, I would, I would get up in the morning to go to work, and, and you know, somebody named Pristine Condition with, with, with her, eye, you know, her, her false eyelids were sort of down here. We passed out on the, on the couch. And, <laughs> and you know, she would, maybe she would wake up, and, uh, you know, I'd say, hey, morning, Pristine. She'd say, hi, honey. You have to work? Uh, I said, yeah. I said, you want a blowjob before you go? <laughs> I said, no, thanks. I, I, I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, was, it was a little bit like living in this sort of whack ball enchanted cottage full of, of very strange fairies and spirits. When I referred before to the, the uncertainty over your books and the number of books I've 
read of a book called Golden yeah, States. Yeah, yeah, yes. Published yes, when you were about 31, first something novel. like that. Yes, yeah, so yes, yes. Tell us about that. I had spent my 20s not only wandering around, you know, the looking for the mad American night. Um, some nights were madder than others. Uh, but I, I couldn't finish anything. I would start a novel and get to a certain point. They're going, no, this one sucks. I'm going to start another one. And then that, I would reach a point where that one fell apart. And I was about to turn 30. And I said to myself, by the stroke of midnight on your 30th birthday, you will have finished a novel. But that was like seven weeks away. <laughs> so I cranked out this book and did finish it on my 30th birthday, but it wasn't, it's not a terrible book. It's not, it has, as, it's not as far as I know, done anyone any harm. Um, <laughs> Much the same as Google. <laughs> <laughs> it also wasn't the best book I, I could write, even at that time. It, 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 I, wrote, I wrote it for other reasons, and I, I never felt really good about it. Um, and I've always felt, even then, that, that one of the many impediments to, to the collective contemporary effort to write novels is there's just too many half-assed books out there vying for people's attention. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to make any grand claims for any of the other books, but they, each of them was the best book I could possibly write, which was not true of that first book. And it felt, it felt like bad vava, it felt like bad karma. And I, 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 I didn't really think it would get published, but it did. And I didn't quite have the guts to say no. But um, I, I don't... I don't bring it up because I would much prefer that that anybody who's interested in what I do read the other books and then take that take a little bit of time that they would devote to Golden States and read something else. <laughs> Maybe you haven't gotten to Stendhal yet. <laughs> um, so I don't I don't conceal it, but I don't yeah. promote it either. And, and you know, I found out other other writers have. Vanished books. Jeanette Winterson has one. E.L. Doctorow has one. We just, you know, you kind of go, oops, you know, let's just, let's just erase that one. Let's take that one out of, uh, out of contention. <laughs> uh, it's a bit like having your own Facebook page, isn't it? Uh, you know, it's, it's a youthful, uh, you, you might see it as a youthful mistake, but it's there for eternity. To, to oh, and yeah, it's a, you know, you, you, I'm shocked at how, a novel with, I think, an initial, an entire print run of 2000 just obdurately continues to exist in the world because collectors show up at my readings over and over again with that goddamn book. Where do you get this? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I believe, was published about 1984. That sounds um, right. Yeah, yeah, you probably know better than I do, but uh, yeah. Which dates, you know, I'm just piecing together, I remember reading um, in your, it might have been in your d dedication uh, for A Home at the End of the World, it had been started about six years before it was published, which was 1990, and you refer to it having been written and, well, started during tough, tough times for yeah. you. Um, I wouldn't write that again. Um, what I meant by tough times was... A, Tough times that any novelist, most novelists go through. I didn't have much money, and I was living with a truly insane boyfriend, so trying to write a novel while, while Christy was like throwing crockery over my head. Um, and I really meant the phrase during tough times as the sort of beginning of a sentence that ended with an appreciation for a friend of mine who let me, a lawyer who let me come to her office and um, hide out there. Right. And, 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 and right there. But, you know, years later, I feel like, little friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, tough times is living in Uganda. Yeah. You know, yeah. Tough times is not what you were going through then. And um, one yeah. of those things. I would take it back if I could. Yeah. It's... Um 
it's a book that was made into a in, in, in made adapted for the screen mm -hmm. um, nice. as was the hours later um, and um, you just told me before we came out I hope this isn't um, uh, you know breaking news that shouldn't be broken but you've just sold a, a pilot to HBO that you've uh, written um, uh, how, do, how do you feel when when um, a lot is made of your the adaptation of your work to the screen do you mm -hmm. feel that it, it um, it is an amplification of the book? Do you feel that it's uh, in a way um, d degrading the book? Do you feel as if um, the the relative uh, um, status people award to the screen? Um, how do you feel about the relationship between mm -hmm. that and, and, and your no, books? I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's just a sort of ongoing transmogrification of the, of, of the book. And, 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 and of course, if I, if I, if I felt badly about about people wanting to make my books into movies i i wouldn't sell my books to the movies um and you know i frankly don't have a lot of patience with writers who complain about about how hollywood has treated them in part because i feel like not only did you know what you're getting into because you know most movies suck what did you think um but but maybe more important i feel like hey it's not the holy book mm. It's not the fingernail of a saint meant to be kept in a golden reliquary and worshipped for centuries. It's a book. And it is, in fact, neither more nor less than the oh, that's probably, the electrocution was a beautiful thing. Um, <laughs> it is the best book you could write at that point in your life because any novelist I respect is spending his or her life learning to write a novel and you die still trying to learn how to write a novel and you, you're doing it by writing novels. So don't think of it as, some, as, as something carved into a tablet, as something sacrosanct. If someone who seems gifted and intelligent to you wants to do something else with it, wants to see if they can find another version of the story to tell as a movie or a TV show or an opera or whatever, go on, yeah. go on, let, let's see what, see what happens. Uh, my favorite, actually, of all the adaptations, uh, when I was in Brazil, this was some time ago, and um, I learned that without getting permission of any kind, making any kind of payment, which they just went ahead and did it. Uh, my, my, my third novel, if we count Golden State, so it was called Flesh and Blood, and it had been made into a um, TV show on like public access by a bunch of Brazilian drag queens. <laughs> and I loved that. I mean, it was terrible, of course, but the idea that was like, like one minute I'm in my room in New York writing this thing, and the next minute a man in a dress is, is delivering it to a television camera, I, th I thought that was kind of great. <laughs> So, uh, did you did you like the adaptation of the hours, which is which is probably what what the audience and audiences generally you 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 speak to? Uh, you know, I did, uh, I did very very much. I also like the adaptation of of Home at the End of the World, and for reasons no one fully understands, the hours was you know a big hit, and Home at the End of the World was seen by you know seventy five people. But um, <laughs> no, I was kind of I was quite happy with what they did with the hours. I think I think. Most, all, you know, all the people involved made a heroic effort, and as, as I'm sure you can imagine, a movie like that isn't easy to get made at a studio like Paramount. And almost everything we like about the about the movie, those of us who like it, was fought for. Most prominently, of course, the Schnazola for Nicole, <laughs> <laughs> which is our Nick. So you know, don't say don't say anything critical of of, of our girl. Oh, we actually don't have anything critical to say about Nick. <laughs> With with the hours, um, and I'll, I'll anticipate you in one sense. You're not going to say, you know, poor me, poor me. Uh, I won a Pulitzer Prize, but mm. um, you know, I hear you introduced um, uh, so many times as the Pulitzer Prize winning author of the hours, and I almost want to jump up in your defence and say, you know, he's he's also the author of these other great books, and and you know, don't don't forget them because any one any, a prize is just mm -hmm, decided mm -hmm. by a small number of people. Any one of them could 
could just as easily have won um, absolutely. Uh, that prize. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, do, do you feel, I'm not going to ask you if you feel it's a burden, but, uh, you know, they're like your children. Do you feel like defending the other ones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, my favorite book is always my most recent book. Because as I said, I feel, I feel like you're learning as you go along, and every book should be really stronger than, than, than the previous book if you're, if, you're, if you're doing your job. But of course, that's not how readers necessarily feel. And yes, on, um, on some sort of whiny days, I will find myself thinking, I will be talking about the hours until the day that I die. <laughs> <laughs> But then I shut myself up and remind myself that a lot of writers don't get to talk about any of their books, mm. you know, so, so, you know, little friend, yeah, deal with it. When, when you referred before to um, the, the, that sense of living in history and um, chronicling um, the history of your time. As the years go by, um, and and I can see I can see how it crops up in by nightfall. Um, how how has your relationship changed to that um, historical event, which was AIDS, mm -hmm. um, when it was just tearing uh, a swathe through communities um, in in the eighties, and and of course it hasn't stopped, but uh, right. it, it it feels like the big event um, or a big world historical event that is a shadow over the lives of your characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I am a gay man who has thus far survived the AIDS epidemic. And, you know, I, I, I think if you were in Rwanda during the genocide, if you were in London during the Blitz, that is just going to be part of what you write about. It's so much a part of your experience. Um, you know, ranging from all those people dying um, to the realization this 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 kind of this one kind of rocked me to the realization that that um, both Ronald Reagan and the first George Bush actually didn't give a shit. Actually, to, had just. Had, decided that, that the people who were most vulnerable to AIDS, which was gay people and intravenous drug users, could just go choke in a bone, could just go die. And that was, uh, you know, as a white guy from the suburbs with this one little hint of mint, that was a bit of a surprise. To, to 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 be written off like that, and you know, in, in, and it, it was a it was a big it was a big slap in the face. And though I do not credit those two monstrous men for for doing anything good in the world, um, it did wake me up a little bit. And you you actually took to the streets, is that right? You 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 engaged mm -hmm. in, in uh... yeah yeah yeah. I was I was part of a, a act up um, <clears throat> because first Reagan and then. Bush weren't doing anything, weren't saying anything. The pharmaceutical companies, though they were doing research because there was obviously a lot of money to be made from the drugs, were, were, were don't get me started, they weren't sharing their research. There was a lot that could have been done that wasn't being done. And a group of us thought that that was kind of you know, unfortunate and we should probably try to draw some attention to it. So, so we, we performed various public actions and, and I like got what, arrested. What did, what did you do? Uh, well, the, the most controversial one was an early one where we, we shut down the stock exchange on Wall Street, which was at the time surprisingly easy to do because no one ever imagined that a bunch of queer balls in suits in disguise were going to go in there and, 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 with, and pull out bullhorns and actually shut down the sock exchange for five minutes. That was a surprise. So you blew the bullhorns, which were taken as a signal to, to stop well, trading. Well, and, and, and you know, say, business is over for today. Everybody listen to what I have to tell you about what's going on down the street, up the block. And it just, it, it, we disrupted things. We're taken away almost instantly. Um, okay. 
I want to pass this along to anybody who might be interested. Um, one of the tricky things about trying to take possession for at any period of time of any controversial institution is, is trying, to, trying to make it work so that you can't be whisked away by the cops in 45 seconds. And if you hand, handcuff yourself, yourself together, you, just, you know, they cut the handcuffs and you're gone in 55 seconds. Um, so we were um, particularly annoyed with a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey, which the, the which had discovered the protease inhibitor, which has turned out to be an enormous, like the, sort of the crucial AIDS drug, and they weren't sharing their research with any other pharmaceutical company. They wanted all the money for themselves, which is understandable from a business point of view, but seemed like a bad idea to us. Um, and so we learned this thing from Greenpeace, where um, you actually handcuff yourself, you, you sit down on the ground and you handcuff yourself to your mates through a length of metal pipe, which means they have to saw it off, which means you're there for hours <laughs> in February in New Jersey. My ass is still cold. Uh, and, they t and they took us to jail. Okay, I, I just have to say this one last little anecdote. They took us to jail. Um, it was when... But it was when Giuliani had become mayor of New York, and there was a get tough policy, which, which meant we were processed like any other criminals, like, which takes about three days. Ordinarily, you kind of speed tracked because you're just a harmless activist, and you're out in about seven hours. And, but they we're there for three days. And um, well, said, well, we are actually criminals. We broke a law, so all right. And they feed you periodically. They, literally, they go through with a cart and throw food into the cell with like 50, 50 men and the women were in a different part. Um, and we were very happy about, him, about being fed. We were bored and hungry and we the, first, the very first time, um, with, oh, look, food, it's, oh, it's a bologna sandwich. <laughs> Great, I, I love bologna. Um, and we all <laughs> bit into our sandwiches and we all kind of looked at each other and said, is there, is there something like crunchy? In your sandwich, yeah. And we peeled off the top layer of bread, and we real well. And the bologna was like the color of a band aid. Um, <laughs> and we realized there were little chips of bone in it. It was jail bologna, made <laughs> by some corrupt meat packing thing, which didn't grind it that carefully because it was just for jail. Right. That, that was kind of rev that was kind of revelatory. <laughs> And, and I've been on the straight and narrow ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, if you did it now, you'd be sent to Cuba for about three years. Uh, to, or, yeah, so or, or maybe forever. Or orange yeah. jumpsuit. Yeah, yeah right. Um, I just wonder, following on from that uh, question, um, what do you, know, do you have a view on how things have changed as far as activism and, you know, uh, uh, regarding AIDS, uh, you know, a corporation would do exactly the same thing today uh, that that company did then. Do you feel that the moment, uh, you know, the, the, the moment has passed, the sense of crisis has passed, um, and, and if so, you know, people, people are still, uh, you know, getting, getting very sick and dying. Yeah, yeah, the crisis has passed for people who can afford the medications. Um, right. The crisis is very much alive uh, in places ranging from, you know, Harlem in New York to the entire continent of Africa. And we did try with ACT UP to sort of move uptown and um, and there we were. White guys trying to help Latino and black intravenous drug users and it, it it didn't work. It didn't work. Our, you know, we had good intentions, but we just felt like, like, like interlopers and like we were sort of coming from a world that was so different from theirs. That, uh... So what's their future? What, uh, who, 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 who can help them? Are they equipped to there are, help there, themselves? Th since, since then, um, people in those communities have, have, have sort of stood up and risen up and are doing what they can, not 
Not so much anymore to speed up the research process as, 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 to, as to get some fucking national health care so, so that being poor in America doesn't equal being dead in America. Yeah. That's real upsetting. Yeah. Got to sound like Gail last night, don't I? <laughs> but I like pornography. <laughs> Hi. Hey. I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about your writing process. My writing process, yes, absolutely. I am enormously disciplined, um, which is, it's not exactly to my credit. My family is, is, is enormously disciplined. We all have like OCD. We are, we're like kind of like messed up. Um, and I always feel that a virtue, the, what, we call, what I call a virtue is a quality you, you don't have but can kind of fake your way into. Like you're, you're afraid but you act heroically, which is virtuous. Um, you know, I come from people who... Uh, if you make dinner for my family, they have, A, been following you around the kitchen, sort of mopping up any, any spot. Um, and, and when you finally serve the dinner, you know. And I think about this, oh, this is delicious. Um, what they're really thinking about is cleaning up after. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a stu- I live in New York. I have a studio that's about 15 minutes from our apartment, and I go there every morning. It's about a 20 minute walk, um, and I turn on some music, um, mainly to get the molecules of the air going. They've gotten, they've gotten, things have gotten a little, a little stale in there overnight. And I, I, want, I want some movement. I want some agitation. And I, I've, I've actually found over many years of, of, of doing that that what starts to happen is whatever the music that I'm listening to, just to, just to jumpstart the oxygen, finds its way into the books. In a, in, a, in a very deep but probably impalpable way, like 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 a home at the end of the world is rock and roll. The sentences are are are, are really meant to emulate a rock beat, whereas the hours is Schubert. And I don't expect anybody to have read the hours. Well, I think that was clearly just a kind of literary version of Schubert, but, <laughs> but in a certain way, it is. And I stay there. I make myself sit for at least four hours, even on the, you know, the bad days, and then um, on a good day I can work for about six. And then I just you know, answer 10,000 emails and do what everybody else, you know, what we all do. But I'm, I'm quite regular with it, and that seems to be what works best for me, in part because you know, part of what you're doing, I think, as a novelist, and maybe, I don't know, Malcolm, well, I'm, I suspect we all feel similarly about this. You're trying to create and sustain and convince yourself of a sort of parallel reality, which you are inventing, but which has to feel real to you. And I find that daily contact with it is, is, is pretty essential. If I let it go too long, I look at what I've gotten. Well, this is just some story I'm making up. This isn't real. Um, but if I wake up every morning and get right to it, I can sort of think of it as, as, as something that's happening in a parallel dimension. The, the downside of that is often um, you're, you're in a long-term relationship. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you and your partner are sitting down having dinner and, you know, he's saying, talking about what happened in the, his day or whatever, and you're going, right, right, <laughs> and actually you're not listening at all and he's, he knows that you're still in the, the, the world that you need to be in. You know, I, um, I would never do that because I'm a great boyfriend and, and I just wouldn't do it. Um, you know, I've, one of the things I figured out for myself over time was hit it, stay with it for the allotted time, and then go away and put it out of your mind. When I was, when I was starting to write... I was thinking about it all the time. I was one of, the, one of those like, irritating, young, aspiring writers who would like, write things down on a cocktail napkin in a bar. And I began to realize that I was turning myself into somebody who essentially saw the real world as, as material for writing, which was making me look at it through a particular kind of lens, like, useful, 
useful. <laughs> I'm useful. Um, so I turn it off, and I don't think about it. I don't let myself think about it until it's time to go back in the morning. Oh, uh, just quickly, you know, um, ACT UP filtered all the way to Melbourne all those years ago. I just wanted to pass that on. And I remember ACT UP, Dance mm -hmm. Proud, Fuck Safe, it was their motto. Um, you know, in w your last book, I'm just wondering the research process that you had for um, finding those, for the art world and finding Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this, 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 this new book, When Nightfall, is, is set in the art world, most particularly the, the world of selling art, um, which I actually already knew a fair amount about. Uh, most of my friends in New York are, are artists, are visual artists, and as opposed to other writers, and a couple of them are dealers. So I'd already heard a fair amount about it from them, and I go to galleries all the time. And then a, a man I know, a heroic art dealer named Jack Shaneman, who has a gallery. It was kind of the model for what I was thinking of for Peter Harris, who owns a gallery. But it, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's a well-regarded sort of second-tier New York gallery. It's not. It's not one. It's not. It's not Larry Gagosian. It's not one of the big monoliths. But it, uh, and, and so anyway, Jack let me hang around, hang around this, the, the gallery for like a week and and help hang a show and talk to the artists and then and then for my graduation, I, I put on a suit and actually I can't believe you let me do this. Posed as 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 a dealer for a day. And talk, you know, talk to the people who would come in and try to sell them art. Um, I didn't sell anything. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I, I actually did get to be an art dealer for a day. That's one of the fun things about writing novels. I, I did hear recently that you, when you were young, you, you had a great ambition to be a, a painter. Oh, I did. It was the thing I, I most wanted to do. And I simply um, found over time that I didn't... <laughs> Uh, I want to say I didn't have the talent for it, but I, I, I think I didn't, I didn't have the will to do it, which is hard to, in a dark room, I think, it's, I, think, I think it's hard to distinguish talent from a kind of will and drive and focus. Um, when I started writing, and this was never true when I was painting, um, I found that I would sit in the chair and sit in the chair and sit in the chair and write that line 40 times if I needed to until it started to come to life. And I started flunking, it was in college, I started flunking my other subjects because I, I, all I could think about was that sentence. Um, so yeah, the die was cast. Mm. So on painting. Uh -huh. Hi. Hey. Um, I loved your book, By Nightfall, best of all your novels so far. Thank um, you. I just want to ask you a slightly trivial question about the mistake on the back cover blurb. Do you have a funny story about it? Did you, you know, have a sort of friends and like reaction and ask the publisher to do a reprint or does it reflect an earlier draft or something, the mistake on the back cover? Oh, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm hearing you right. Uh, is there a mistake, like a, an actual mistake in one of the books or, or? No, on the back cover of By Nightfall where it says, that it's about a childless, that oh, describes him oh, as being childless you know, I when he isn't. I thought they pulled all those back. Did you get, you get your hands on one? Did they really reprint them? They did reprint them. Oh, because of that? Yeah, yeah. No, they, they, uh, I, I got an enormously apologetic email from oh, the, no, from I the English one. editor I saying, it was saying I'm so, so, so sorry, but we will, we will reprint. I, I, yeah, I guess, I, guess they got, I, guess they, I guess they got out there. You know... Just if I can explain, explain for those who haven't read it, Sorry. Um, the couple, Rebecca and Peter, have an adult daughter who's a pretty major character in the book. It's <laughs> to call them childless is um, <clears throat> yeah, somewhat indicative yeah, of the yeah. Uh, yeah. Level you know, of frankly, I would sort of like to be a bigger diva than I am. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I, 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 I'm thinking about the next book, and oops, yeah, they, they, that was that was a mistake, wasn't it? Okay, correct it. I, I, I can't get too worked up over that stuff. I'm worked up over enough. 
But so yeah, I mean, I, I, I um, oops. <laughs> yeah, reprint. You know, we're, the worst story I've ever heard is uh, a novelist named Matthew Stadler, an American novelist. Uh, somehow the drafts, I think it was a Simon and Schuster, got mixed up, and they published an early draft rather than the finished draft. That was really unfortunate. Well, that's that's what they did with Jonathan Franson with with Freedom, uh, the U UK oh, publisher. Oh God! What? I was just forgetting yeah, about yeah. that. It wasn't an early draft, but it was it was an uncorrected uh, proof that he had done a fair bit of work on that. Uh, okay, you know, I take it back. I am that much of a diva because that would make me insane. <laughs> that would make me insane. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, you know, the, the, the idea of of presenting something that wasn't as taken as far as you possibly could. Now, I would I would be actually livid and murderous. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, somebody was, yep. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm Chris, how are you doing? Um, I just read, um, I just finished reading Specimen Days on Sunday, which is a fabulous book. I really loved it. Um, Thank you. And I'm curious to know if you prefer writing about the past, contemporary life, or indeed the future in Specimen Days, mm -hmm. and will we ever see a science fiction novel from you? Oh, oh, oh. Can everybody hear that? Um, yeah, uh, I I wouldn't say that I have much, uh, any particular preference for the past versus the present, because when you're writing a story set in the past, I think you just sort of, you have to approach it as a story set in a present that occurred in the 12th century. Uh, science fiction, you know, I don't know. I love science fiction as, as a reader. Um, and I found it enormously difficult to write, much, much more so than I had expected it to be. You know, I, I'm silly. I, I don't know what made me think that, that there would be anything easy about a genre like science fiction. But it, it, was, it was quite difficult to sort of bring it to life and, 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 and to create an imaginary world that was not based on, the, on your observations of, of the, the actual world. Um, and did you write that in, in blocks, uh, Specimen Days? I did. Uh, I, 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 each, each one built on the other. I, I, I always work sequentially. Right, right. So um, you you constructed them as, as three distinct blocks and, and that you wrote uh, end on end and then mm -hmm. worked out a way of breaking them up and, uh, and interleaving them amongst uh, each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Three and stories with, and you with kind the of hours, them together. With the hours as well. No, the hours I kind of I kind of blipped around. Um, one of the great things about any kind of triptych is if you get stuck on one story, you can just kind of work work on another one. And that's the, yeah that one. I but I don't. What I don't do uh, is write out of out of write any any one story line out of out of sequence. I don't I don't write that scene that's going to happen a year from now. I can't. I I, I feel like every act on the character's part sort of determines the next, the next act. And I, I, don't, I don't know where it's going. And I worry that if I did know where it, it was going, I would end up with a group of characters whose kind of job it is to haul the story to that remote railway station. And, you know, hmm, yeah. bad idea. Um, as you said before, uh, you know what uh, what interests you most is, and what what do you have the most affection for is your most recent book. Um, am I able to ask you what what you're working on uh, now, and what what's what's uh, involving your your writing life at the moment? You know, yeah, sure, it, it will it will change enormously because as, as all my books do I, I, you, I think you kind of want to end up writing a book very different from the book you thought you were going to write but it, it is a kind of companion piece to by nightfall and it doesn't involve the world of art but um, you know by nightfall involve, involves a body of characters who are, are struggling to 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 find some kind of peace and happiness with the prosperity that is the envy of ninety nine percent of the known world, and I don't think anybody in the world 
everybody in the world is entitled to their sorrow, including the rich. But um, now the next one is is about a search for kind of tra peace and transcendence on the part of people who live about a hundred blocks north in Manhattan of where Peter and Rebecca live, people who don't have anything and who find consolation in drugs and other behaviors that were not so much a part of these people's lives. So this is Columbia University uh, academics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how, did, how did you know exactly? Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions from the floor? We've got time for, for one or two more. Yeah, yeah, plenty of hands. Um, hey, you said that it was a novelist's job to capture the world around you. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about, or is there any plan to write a book in your own voice rather than through characters? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I, I think of my books as being written in some version of my own voice. Uh, <clears throat> Home at the End of the World is written in the first person, but uh, as far as I can mm, 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 that's the only one. Um, <clears throat> there, every book is written in my own voice, though, with... Oh, 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 a, a, like autobiography? Oh, no. <laughs> you know, because, 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 because the stuff I'm willing to talk about isn't that interesting, and the stuff that's really interesting I'm not willing to talk about. <laughs> oh, I see what you were saying. Yes, of course, of course. If only all memoir, memoirists had the same discretion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm in the middle of reading By Nightfall at the moment and read a few of your other books, and your characters stay in my head and I think about them a lot even when I'm at work I'm still thinking about them when That's I'm trying great. to do other I'm things very happy to hear that. and I was wondering if the characters stay in your mind if they linger around you or once you've finished a book you've you've left them be and you know that you're finished or do they come back to you you know I do I do think about the characters after a novel is done up to a point, but then it's time to move on and it's time to try to imagine and create other characters. And I, uh, I do move on for all of my, well, never mind about my questionable habits. I am, um, I'm in some way deeply monogamous. <laughs> I, I do marry for life, and um, well, I'm a serial monogamous as a writer because because once once I'm embarked on something new with a new body of people, I have to let those other people go. So yeah, no no, not many visits to ex wives. Um, one of the things that was prominent about ACT UP in New York, more so than here, was the role of, of gay performers, gay artists, uh, photographers, painters. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a kind of queer sensibility, if, one, if you want to use that kind of word, that was behind the politics in a really direct way. Yeah. And I wonder, I think that time is over, but I wonder, is a gay novelist always a gay novelist that has some kind of obligation as a result of being a gay mm -hmm. novelist mm -hmm. to somehow do something gay in what you do <coughs> in your writing? Um, I think any novelist has only one obligation, which is to write the best damn novel you possibly can. And, that, and that's your only obligation. If you are a gay man and you find yourself moved to write about gay men, sure. If you are a gay man and you find yourself interested in characters who are not gay, Go ahead. Um, I sort of like the gay stuff. But no, I mean, I, 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 think, I, think, I think as an artist who is gay, you have no gay obligation at all. I think as a citizen who is gay, you have an inescapable obligation to be out to everybody. 
That's your readers, that's your boss, that's your parents, even if it will make your parents unhappy, even if it will delay your career, your, your progress up the corporate ladder. People fail in this moral obligation because human beings fail in our moral obligations. But I don't like it portrayed as anything less than a moral obligation. You are a gay man or a lesbian, and your, your political obligation as a citizen is to let everybody know who you are and what you are, because homophobia is only going to end when people really understand that here we are. And it's your son and your daughter and your employee. Yeah. yeah. So, so easy on the art is a little harder on everybody else. <laughs> I always thought a gay novel was a novel that chased around and slept with other novels. Uh, <laughs> which, which I guess The Hours, the hours is certainly a gay novel. It, uh, it sleeps with Mrs. Dalloway. <laughs>